I'm going to attempt to do a little review guide walkthrough where I give you help, a little bit of help on most of these sections here. So the first one here is writing and solving the equation. It says solve, uh, suppose the current temperature is 64 degrees Fahrenheit is expected to rise 2 degrees Fahrenheit each hour for the next several hours. In how many hours will the temperature be 86 degrees? So the first thing is that we need to know what we're missing here. It says in how many hours. So we're going to say that in our equation, H is going to stand for the number of hours. Um, we know the current temperature is 64 degrees. And it's expected to rise. So think about what operation um, that would go with that. So if we're, if we're going to be rising or raising the temperature, it's going to be adding 2 degrees every hour. So that's where our hours are going to come into play. I'm going to let you finish writing that equation. I've just given you a start, and that's what I'm going to do a lot of these, just kind of give you a start. And finish writing that equation, you also need to solve it to figure out how many hours there are. On the second section here, it says write each algebraic expression in simplest form. So this is all about combining like terms. Uh, there's, there's not, these are not equations here. You can't figure out what x equals. So on the first one here, you've got 6x and negative 2x that can be combined. And then you've got negative 8 and plus 4 that can be combined. So in the end, you're going to figure out what 6x minus 2x is. And then negative 8 plus 4, what that is. And you're going to have two terms in the end, something x plus or minus something after that. So just combine your like terms. On number 3 here, you have distributive property you do first on all these. You'll bring all that down, and then you'll look for like terms to combine there as well. So in the end, again, on numbers two and three, these are not equations. You can't come up with a final solution there. On four and five, it says solve each equation, check your solution. I'll get you started on, uh, I'll actually start on number five here. So the first thing is you have, have parentheses you have to get rid of. So we're going to do seven times x, seven times negative nine, which is negative 63. 9 times 2x is 18x, and 9 times negative 7, or negative 8 is negative 72. You also have this plus 4x at the end that you just need to bring down. Now the second step, and this one's often overlooked, is to combine like terms on each side of the equal sign. So here's your equal sign. There are no like terms over here to combine, but there are here. So we have 18x and 4x that we need to combine. So just bring everything else down at this point. 7x minus 63 equals, and then we're going to combine 18x plus 4x, which gives us 22x minus 72. At this point, you need to eliminate the variable on one side of the equation. You've got x on this side and x on this side. So your next step here will be to subtract 7x on each side. So that'll cancel out. Bring down your negative 63. Do 22x minus 7x. Bring down your negative 72. Go ahead and just bring all that down. You'll end up with just a two-step equation to finish things off. And then when you check your solution, you need to plug in x everywhere we see x to see if the two sides come out equal. So I'm going to leave you there to finish that one off. On uh, numbers uh, 6 and 7, um, it says determine if each equation has one, none, or infinitely many solutions. If there's only one solution, you need to give it. So this first one has uh, fractions in it. So um, you need to figure out if there's a common denominator, and there is. To eliminate those fractions, you're going to multiply everything in the equation except for the stuff in parentheses times that denominator. So that means the 2 fifth gets multiplied times 5, the 4 fifths gets multiplied by 5, and the 8 gets multiplied by 5. Don't forget to multiply the 8 by 5 as well. So you multiply those things, bring all that down, and then you'll do your distributive property next after that. Um, remember, when you're looking for infinitely many solutions or no solution, if the two sides come out to be exactly the same, it's infinitely many solutions. If you cancel out all your variables and you end up with something like 7 equals 5 or something like that, then that's something that's not true. That's when there's no solution. Okay? Otherwise, the equation just solves like we did here on 4 and 5, and you get one solution. So I'm going to let you guys finish those out on your own. By the way, you may feel like you need to pause the video on some of these and finish working these out. This is not necessarily a video you're meant to watch all the way through without stopping. You're probably going to need to stop it and work out some of these problems and then go on to the next part here. All right, this says evaluate each expression, express the result in scientific notation for these. So the Atlantic Ocean has an area of 33,420,000 square miles. Write this number in scientific notation. 
Well, remember in scientific notation, the decimal is supposed to end up after the first digit that's not a zero. It's supposed to end up right there. Right now, it's right here. So to write this in scientific notation, you need to move the decimal over until you end up in that spot. Count the number of spaces you move. That will be your exponent here. And, uh, and you can figure out whether or not it's positive or negative by whether or not this is originally a very large number. If it's a large number, it's going to be a positive exponent. If it's a small number, like 0. .000 something, it's going to be a very small number, so it's going to end up as the negative exponent. So you're just writing that in scientific notation. Number nine, you're multiplying these numbers here in scientific notation. So remember to multiply the coefficients, two times seven, and then multiply the powers. To multiply powers, you add the exponents together. And then you have to make sure that it's in scientific notation in the end. The decimal's in the right spot. If you have to move the decimal to make it less, you have to make the uh, exponent one more. If you move the decimal to make the number more than it was, you have to move the decimal to, or the exponent to make it one less. So just make sure that you end up with the number in scientific notation there. Number 10 says the Southern Ocean is uh, 2.03 times 10 to the seventh. Arctic Ocean is 1.4 times 10 to the seventh. How many more kilometers squared is the Southern Ocean than the Arctic Ocean? Doesn't say how many times more, just how many more. When you're comparing things and seeing how many more something is than something else, you will be subtracting. And when you add or subtract numbers in scientific notation, your, your uh, exponents have to be the same first. These are the same already. So you're ready to go ahead and subtract 2.03 minus 1.4. When you get that answer, remember what happens with uh, numbers in scientific notation with the exponent. When you're adding subtracting, the exponent just stays the same in the answer. So you're ready just to subtract those and keep the exponent the same there. Um, on number 11, we have just a simplify here. In this case, it means to, to square these things. When you have a power to a power, that's the only time you actually square. But six does not have an exponent with it, or that's the only time you actually multiply, excuse me, that's the only time you actually multiply these exponents. Uh, six does not already have an exponent with it, so, but all these things, six, x, y, all these things get this exponent of two applied to them. So six squared, or six times six is 36, x to the seventh squared, since it's a power to a power, you will multiply those exponents. You get x to some power, not two, I meant to put a question mark there. So some power, and then y to the fourth to the second, you'll get to some power as well. So you gotta multiply those exponents to get that. Number 12 says to evaluate the expression. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and, and take this negative exponent. The first thing we need to do when you, multi when you try to evaluate a negative exponent is you need to change it into a positive somehow, following the rules. If you remember, you gotta first make it into a fraction and then you flip the whole thing over. This becomes one over two to the positive third. And then you just gotta figure out now on your own what two to the third is and that'll be your base there, whatever that is. And that's it, that'll be your, you're not your base, but your denominator there. On 13 and 14 it says simplify and it says express using positive exponents. So I'll do the first one here for the most part with you and then you guys figure out how to do number 14. So remember when we divide powers, we keep the base the same, and then we subtract their exponents. Eight minus two will be whatever that gives you there. Okay, you guys figure that out. And then y to the fifth divided by y to the negative third, you subtract those exponents. But remember, it's five minus negative three. So figure out what that's gonna be. And I think those both end up being positive exponents. We don't have to change anything or flip anything around there. So. Let's take a look at number 14 because this is where things actually get a little trickier here. So when we multiply powers, we keep the base the same and we add the exponents together. So the negative fourth and the negative second, we get to the negative sixth. Why to the sixth to the third? Six plus negative three is positive three. So here's where you have to make sure you use positive exponents. We do make this into a fraction but we only take the thing that has the negative exponent, the base and its exponent, and we send that to the denominator, and then it becomes positive. So it'd be y to the third over, and then we x to the negative sixth gets sent to the bottom, becomes x to the positive sixth. So I'll finish that one out for you there. I'm not doing that with many of these, but we'll finish that one out. Um, on 15 and 16, it says to evaluate um, x, to, x equals negative four, y equals five. So you're gonna plug those in where you see x and y, and then you're going to 
finish that out and evaluate those. So I'll let you guys figure out 15. You plug those in and add them together and then you cube it. But let's do 16. Uh, I'll get it set up for you at least here. So we have y in that first spot. So it's 5 squared minus. And then when you plug in a negative number, it needs its own set of parentheses. So negative 4 and that's squared as well. So according to order of operations, we would do what's in parentheses first, but we don't, we don't have anything to do in those parentheses. It's just a, a negative 4. So the next thing would be the exponents. So do 5 squared and figure out what that is. Minus negative 4 squared, figure out what that is. And then to just subtract those two numbers. I'll finish that one out for you. 17, put the numbers in order from least to greatest. So we have some negatives and some positives. You need to put them in order from least to greatest. Um, starting with the negative numbers, right? And the, the number that is the, the biggest number with the negative is going to be the number that is the least. So these are already in decimal form, but you'll need to put these in decimal form. So um, you'll need to start with this one. You may need to do some long division for this. And I'll just set it up for you here, but I won't finish it out for you. So you've got 5 elevenths. You're going to need to do long division to figure out what that is in decimal form top dog in the dog house, right? We've talked about that before. So the 5 goes in there, the 11 on the outside. You put your decimal here. We know we have a, a negative 7 whole number. So we can go ahead and put that in. And then you begin putting 11 into 5, which can't be done. So 11 into 50. And you, you go from there. See if you can finish that out and figure out what that's going to be in decimal form. Square root of 59. Um, you need to estimate this square root to the nearest tenth. You just need one number after the decimal. That should be enough to figure out because you've only have two um, positive numbers here. You just need to figure out where these are going to go in order. So think about the square root of 59. Your two perfect squares on either side of 59 are 49 and 64. So you've got 59 here. So the square root of 49 is 7. The square root of 64 is 8. So this would be 7 point something. So think about here, now there's a couple different ways to do this. You can either do the guess and check method where we put something in there and try it out, multiply it times itself to see how close we get to 59. Or you can set up a fraction here. So the fraction would be from 49 to 59. So from the smaller square root to the number in the problem is 10. And then from 49 to, the, to 64, from one perfect square to the other. So out of 15 there. That's a fraction that can actually be reduced. You can probably figure out whether or not that's going to be greater or less than 7.5 and then get those numbers in order from least to greatest. So I'm going to leave you to finish that one on your own. Um, 18 and 19 says write the letter that best matches the location of each rational number. So you might use long division again for this one to figure out where that's going to end up. And then you'll need to estimate this square root to see where that's going to end up. So you need to come up with those decimal forms. 20 and 21 says, name all the sets of numbers to which each real number belongs. So remember, irrational numbers go on and on forever and never repeat. Everything else is rational. And then if it's rational, you need to decide if it is uh, a whole number, or excuse me, if it's rational, you decide if it's an integer. If it's an integer, a positive or negative number without a, a decimal or fraction after it, then you need to decide if it is uh, a whole number or not. So decide whether or not that's rational or irrational. And then it's the same with square root of 81. Some square roots are rational, some are irrational. Depends on whether or not you get a whole number with them. If it's a whole number, then it's also going to be an integer and a whole number as well. So it's going to be rational, integer, and whole, or just irrational. Uh, number 22 says write the fraction as a decimal. If the decimal repeats, use bar notation. So once again, you're just going to use long division to change this. You would put top dog in the dog house, 8 on the outside, and you would begin to divide that to figure out what that would be in decimal form. Um, you do not round on that one. Keep going until you run out or until it repeats. 23, write the decimal as a fraction in simplest form. you got your whole number. The repeating part, whatever part repeats, is your numerator. And remember, with repeating decimals, you put a 9 in the denominator for each digit that repeats. So think about how many digits repeat and write that many 9s in the denominator. And then you need to reduce that fraction there. 24 and 25, it says find each square root. You're going to uh, think about the all these in here are perfect squares. So with this, it's just the negative square root of 36, so negative whatever square root of 36 is. 
for 25, you've got um, square root of 64 over 21. For a fraction like this, you just take the square root of the numerator and the square root of the denominator, and that's your new fraction. And it might need to be reduced or it might not. It just kind of depends on what you got there. 26, solve the equation, check your solution. You've got x squared and then a equals 49. You need to get rid of this squared. The opposite of squared is to take this square root. So that would cancel out. And whatever the square root of 49 is, but remember for each number there's actually two square roots, a positive and a negative. So this will be x will equal something positive and something negative. That's, that's the same number there. We've already briefly talked about long division or guess and check for these. You're, you're going to be taking this, estimating the square roots of those using long division. So um, there's either the guess and check method, there's the long division method. You can use either one of those. You can look back at lessons eight and nine if you need help with those. And I think that's where we're going to stop because on 29 through 34, this is transformations and we just recently did those. So you can look back at your notes of, of lessons 33, 34, 35 with help on that. Really also lesson 36, we probably should add that on there too because that's where we had the rules for transformations as well. So that's it. We went a little over 15 minutes, but not too bad. So that's just a little bit of um, help for you on this review guide.